there now. Mm -hmm. Is are are you going to be okay? I I so what it what it what we're going to actually open this conversation. What did what did Rachel share with you? Well, she said she has never had such a hard time writing a uh, a, a you know a weekly schedule. She said in, instead of just meeting on Thursday, she feels it's a crisis time and she wants to have a to to talk on Tuesday to all the people that are her regular students and that love her poetry and also love Israel because she 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 just obviously very concerned. Oh, it's a terrible it's a terrible time. And 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 um and actually um I are would you feel at liberty would you think that I could how many people are part of her classroom is it hundreds or is it a smaller group? It, it it varies. I mean, never less than maybe eighty, but up to one hundred and fifty or more. Um, it 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 varies um, and, depending on the topic. But some of us, I mean, I'd say there's at least eighty people from the United States that are in her class, but then also from all around the world, including Jackie. Jackie's often there, and I don't know about Sylvia, but I know that. Um, uh, no, Rosa, that's a, I guess Rosa, what I'm saying is. I'm I'm interested in hearing what she would have to say about what's happening right now. Well, she, um, hasn't, she didn't. She emailed today. She didn't really say anything except hard times. I have never had a harder time composing my weekly email to you. I trust you are watching the news and do not need me to elaborate on the details. I have no way of knowing what will happen between now and our scheduled class on Thursday. Right. Many of you may. Be together so let's do this i'm scheduling a special class that's all that's that's i'm sharing it all with you i don't okay, think no, well that, that's fine is there a link to the class that i'd get in or would i not get in on tuesday yeah I will say thank you thank you okay so um I, we're gonna begin our class now you know it almost seems i'm really glad jack is here um just to sort of help me facilitate this this gathering um, you know, our our, our um, topic today is to is really about you know how um, Israelis and Palestinians can uh, live together to share a, to share a land um, and both thrive on it. And um, the launching text, which we will look at, is the, is the one of the most profound texts in all of Torah, which is Je Genesis twenty one. Um, when Sarah makes the very aggressive decision to to send out Hagar and Ishmael from uh, the family, and the sources that were created in, when this program, when this uh, um, uh, curriculum was developed in two thousand and eight, uh, to, you know, really are um, were designed to have us wrestle with. Um, a, a safe and secure state of Israel that was not at, uh, you know, in the middle of a civil war or on the brink of a civil war, but it was more like, you know, how do we work with the nations around us, right? So I think it's really important for all of us to recognize that probably many of Israel's own great challenges at the root of it are really the fact that there are many, many ways of understanding and interpreting Torah. That's one of the things that we're going to learn. And those different ways of interpreting Torah are have reached a volcanic precipice in the country right now. And the important thing for us to do, what I want to do is I want to use the tools um, of 49 and 49, meaning really being able to look at um, what you feel is just the most possibly ludicrous way of reasoning and say, wait a minute, you know, how can I find uh, validity um, in, in what's going on? It gets very hard when we're talking about charismatic figures looking out for their own interest. I think that's really, you know, a, a big piece of what, what, what we've also learned and what we know in our prayers and what we try to guard against every day is becoming 
our the en- be- becoming our own worst enemy. Meaning, it's it's one thing when you're defending the en- enemy from outside, but each of us have the capacity to be that person. So we w- we not only want to protect ourselves, but we want to make sure we never do that. Do you know what I'm saying? So I just want to say. Um, that there's a lot to talk about. And it feels funny today learning this lesson in light of what's going on in the country. I just, so Donna was sharing that um, her that her teacher, Rachel Elior um, is, no, not Elior, Rachel Corazine, thank you. Um, you know, I mean, it, you know, 80-year-old Israelis are going like, whoa, what's going on? So, and and again, it's easy for us to not know. My daughter's uh, university was canceled. No one said that she has to come home yet, but may happen. I'm supposed to leave a week from today, still planning on going. Not sure what that means. Will I get home? What is that? You know, all these, all these things are going on. So um, any, any sort of Anybody with an uh, uh, an eye of expertise or relatives living there who have what to share just about uh, before we launch into our lesson? I know, Rosalie, you have family there. Um, is there, uh, you know, any word from, uh, no? Okay. Jack, anything you know or want to share with the group? We're going uh, four weeks from today to see my father-in-law. And uh, yeah, I mean... Who knows if the airports will even be functioning? Right. And um, and that is, you know, and that is because of um, all that's happening. So what I what I want to do, um, j- just sort of share some little headlines before oh. we go into our program. Can I just say something? Please. Um. um okay. Okay, Um, you will be able to get out of Israel because they will get you out. I don't know what airlines you're using. Yeah. Um, I I, I do know that with COVID, when it first started, I was supposed to come. I I don't know what airline. Hang on a second. Are you getting feedback? Yes, hold on a second. Hold on. I was supposed to come. I don't know what airline. Hang on a second. Are I'm you pre- getting feedback? Yeah. Hold on a second. Hold on. I was supposed to know an airline. Hang on a second. Are you getting feedback? Yeah. Hold on a second. Hold on. I was supposed to know an airline. Getting feedback. Yeah. Hold on a second. Hold on. Getting feedback. I'm sorry. Okay. Is there still feedback? Okay, go ahead. Uh, Let me let me talk. Hello. Yes. Yeah, you just they will get you out of the country. Like with COVID when I was there three years ago, I was supposed to leave, I don't know, five days later, and I got a phone call from the airlines next day you know go for a, and i didn't have to go for a COVID test and not it, it wasn't rampant at that point but they wanted us out of the country and if this gets dangerous they will want you out of the country so not to worry about that okay um so just just a few things to be mindful of as we enter our lesson um uh the traditional lesson so i'm going to try to share my screen again I hope this doesn't do exactly what it did before. So um, it basically, the headlines are, this is just if you read Haaretz, which I assume that many of you do, um, uh, there, there is, uh, you know, there's a general strike, which is, you know, and so it says that Netanyahu is gonna freeze the judicial overhaul um, Smot, uh, uh, Smotrich says that the religious Zionist party, if they freeze the judicial overhaul, it's going to be anarchy. Interesting. Israel's National Labor Union shuts down Ben Gurion Airport, no incoming or outgoing flights. Foreign diplomats express concern over Israel's political crisis. And um, Ben Gavir wants a National Guard that he controls. That should not happen. 
And then there's the headlines and firing uh, Gallant, Netanyahu proved that he puts his own fate over Israel's national security. And that is for sure. There is no compromise with um, uh, Netanyahu's tyranny. And um, it's the, the streets are being flooded, how Israel's historic night of protest came to be. And, uh, and then, whoops. And then the far right is also going to go to battle with their guns and their knives. So, um, you know, it's, I, I guess what the reason I wanted to bring that to your attention to start this class is like to talk about Sarah and Hagar kind of seems like we're talking about, you know, do we have yellow cake or white cake? And of course it's not, it, you know, it's not the, um, that's not, I'm, I don't mean to be funny when I say that, but it's really, we're dealing with such, such high stakes now for the, for the, for the soul of the country. So let me, um, uh, bring up the, uh, the, the source sheets and we'll start. I'm going to share. And, uh, I am open to your thoughts. I think that we, as a Jewish community right now, this, the 14 of us are a little community and we're 16. We are, um, you know, we want to be able to, uh, talk as Jews who love Israel and, uh, pursue justice and want Israel to be a happy and safe home for everybody. At least I certainly would love Israel to be a happy and safe home for everybody. The Jewish people, of course, and the other residents of the country. And, you know, in theory, if our own psychology didn't get in the way, um, that's probably possible, but cl closer than we know. So, um, but we're going to begin with this uh this text, and many of you know it because it's what we read on Rosh Hashanah. Ibai Elohu, a question was asked in the Beit Midrash. When can we coexist with the other? And in this case, as you read this, I want you to think of the other as our own brother, okay? And when do we need to separate, separate and protect our own? And I also think that as Americans, this is the rabbi in me, wants to say that we also should read this in light of some of the challenges in our own country right now, which so many of us couldn't have really imagined even 10 years ago. Like, yes, there's different political views, but now it's like, you know, are we two separate countries? These are really important questions. And, and, uh, and, and of course, as with all great Torah, we can find some insight into it here. So um, if we look here, uh, I'm gonna make this a little bigger. And uh, and Donna, I'll invite you to read. Do you wanna read uh, the beginning verse eight? Sure. The okay, Genesis 21, eight to 13, the new JPS, eight. The child grew up and was weaned and Abraham held a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. Sarah saw the son whom Hagar, the Egyptian had born to Abraham, playing as a check. She said to Abraham, cast out that slave woman and her son, for the son of that slave shall not share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly, for it concerned a son of his. But God said to Abraham, do not be distressed over the boy or your slave. Whatever Sarah tells you, do as she says, for it is through Isaac that offspring shall be continued for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him too, for he is your seed. Okay, beautiful, thank you. And just to look at this alternative translation, Mitzachek shows up a number of times in Tanakh and can mean, you know, a simple word like, you know, um, Mitzachim, like we're playing, right? But it can also have much um, more significant implications um, in a in a um, in a hurtful way. So the art scroll says the child grew and was weaned. Abraham made a great feast on the day Isaac was weaned. Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, mocking. That is another way. And we're going to look at the different uses of Mitzachim. I also just want to point out because our our time will be limited that um, many a couple of commentators 
when, when they talk about this very, very important verse, verse nine, actually don't focus on that when they talk about why Sarah um, uh, cast out Hagar and Yishmael, they focus on this. Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave shall not share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. So some people, people say that, you know, Isaac and, and Yishmael got along fine, which was the problem because she wanted her son to have the whole inheritance. So, it, you know, even just when you look at these two contrasting verses of Torah, we don't really know exactly why she threw them out. We don't know if it's mitzah and what that meant. And depending on who's the uh, commentator and the perspective which they have, and also the political viewpoint that they have, that's going to tell you what they're going to focus on. So let's look at some of those. Okay. So understanding the 49 versus 49 conflicting interpretations of the facts of the biblical story. How did the following commentators understand what was motivating Sarah to say what she said and what she did? And how understandable were her fears and concerns? So um, uh, Sylvia, you wanna read what, what the great Ibn Ezra, um, our, the Spanish commentator who was also a philologist had to say? Yeah, thank you, I will. Um, Ibn, Ibn Ezra, Genesis 29. You don't need to read that. We can see it. Go ahead. Playing. Okay, good. Sorry. Playing, for such is the way of any youth. And she, Sarah, was jealous of him, for he was older than her son. Right. So Ibn Ezra says he was playing, like kids play. They throw a ball, they tag, whatever. And Sarah, um, was she wasn't jealous of Ishmael. She was jealous of Ishmael on Isaac's behalf. Maybe Ishmael was tall and handsome and strong. Maybe she knew that Abraham really loved Ishmael. And now Isaac might even start to love Ishmael. If you have an older brother who's going to play with you, like how many of us loved our older siblings when we were little, right? And then and Elie Wiesel um, continues uh, to, uh, from, from his wise men and their tales, Let's read a little bit more of this. Keep going, Sylvia, later on. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Later on, things become even more inflamed. Hagar comes back with her son, and then Sarah has a son of her own. But instead of making peace with the servant, instead of being grateful to fate after all, her greatest wish has come true. She has become a mother. Sarah continues to torment Hagar and her child. The servant acts with restraint and watches her every step, every gesture, every word that's clear since Sarah's no longer, Sarah no longer complains. Then suddenly, Abraham's wife uh, picks on little Ishmael. Now it is he whom she scrutinizes and suspects. This too is clearly indicated in the text she sees Ishmael playing with Isaac and she gets upset. Why does that upset her? What could be more natural, more beautiful than to see two children, two brothers playing together? Sarah finds this neither beautiful nor touching. Had Ishmael done otherwise, had he avoided his little brother, had he chosen not to play with him, Sarah surely would have accused him of something else, of duplicity, of selfishness, of childish cruelty. She seems to hate him. Nothing about him pleases her. She dislikes the way he dresses, eats, speaks, and sleeps. She resents his joy. Finally, she turns to her elderly husband and demands that he expel the servant and her son. She does not even refer to them by name. Send them away, she says, for I refuse to let the son of the servant share my, son's inher my son Isaac's inheritance. Her son has, ha <coughs> excuse me, has a name. The other does not. The apparent reason for this request, Abraham's wealth. The text says so, and most commentators emphasize the point. What? Sarah is concerned with earthly possessions? Sarah, a materialist who wants everything for her son alone? A mother for whom no one else exists in the world? No, her behavior toward Ishmael is not appealing. Our empathy, our sympathies go instead with her to her victims, Hagar and Ishmael. Now, 
Thank you, Sylvia. Um, I'm just going to, uh, th that's that's one side. We're going to look Wait. at the other side, but I, I want to just pause for a second and just hear your comments and thoughts on this before we look at the next uh, commentators who actually think Sarah was 100% justified in what she did. I just want you to know that this is not a one-sided conversation, but I'd love to hear uh, what some of you are thinking. Didn't, didn't, she, didn't Sarah want um, Abraham to go and, and have intercourse with um, Hagar, to have a child with Hagar? Oh, so, it's, 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 it's a Herbie has, yes. Right, right. So it's like, be careful what you wish for. Right. She, now she got it and now she, you know, wants to throw them out. Yep. Yes. Uh, Rochelle. I, I have a question. I was under the impression, as with other women, when they couldn't conceive and they sent their slaves to their husbands to have children, that the children that they had were hers, were Sarah's. That's, so I'm kind of, I think that, I think that um, Sarah wasn't, did not get the same kind of treatment that most other women did. It seems that Hagar kept her son to herself rather than turning her over. Well, actually, it's a, that's, a, that's a very interesting, um, it, it, that, that is not, the text does not say that. And, and in fact, there, what's not said in the text is, was there a time after Yishmael was born when they were actually one big happy family, where Sarah was the mother, where she did love Yishmael, where they did things together. And, you know, and because it really was, it was, Ishmael was supposed to be her child. But one of the things we learn about Sarah, which is interesting in a previous Parsha, is that she tells Abraham that she wants this baby, but she, but the minute Hagar gets pregnant, which it wasn't Hagar's fault that she was fertile, she resents her. And, and, and beats her and is mean to her. That, that the text says, I mean, we do learn a little bit about Sarah um, and that, that, that she had a lot of pain, obviously, that would lead her to do some harsh things to this slave woman. You know, we, we, we never, there's nothing in the text that indicates that Hagar is snobby or, you know, the Midra, there are Midrashim that definitely go there because they're trying to understand why would Sarah have been so mean to her just because she got pregnant at the, at her own request. You know what I'm saying? So it's, so like anything, there's so many different ways to look at it. You know what I mean? But thank you for bringing that up. But, I, but there always was that notion. I, I, I once wrote a paper on, um, on the happy family before Isaac came along. And that they sort of figured out how to do it. And then, yes, Dad. Uh, Dad, I think you're on mute. Here I am. In reading uh, the, I'm not sure in what chron chronology to this uh, excerpt that we're studying, but Sarah was not a nice person. <laughs> and I think that really, uh, you just don't change that, whatever the issues are. I think when she was learned that she was going to have a baby, she laughed, but it, the way I translated it almost mocked the idea how, uh, you know, uh, she wasn't excited or delighted. I, that's the text I remember. So first of all, Dad, I, I mean, that, that is one way to read Sarah. If you just do a simple reading of Sarah in the Torah, after after her early trials, we, you know, we don't know, for instance, what we don't know is how happy were Sarah and Abraham as a young couple? Um, how, how well did Abraham support her when she was feeling sad she couldn't have a kid? How did she actually tolerate being at, um, sort of pimped out by her husband when they were in these foreign lands? I mean, there's so much that goes into making Sarah, Sarah. I don't think it's simply that we can say, and this is me doing the 49-49, it's trying to say, I don't think we can say she was not a nice person. She'd been through, she'd been through a lot in her life. She left her entire family. No one says what happened to Sarah. You know, we don't really know about Sarah's mother and father or when she left, you know, or of the Chaldees. Did she leave some siblings she really liked? I mean, if you really put yourself in her mind, she she went with her husband because that's what you did, and she started a whole new people. And, uh, and, and, and she had some really complicated situations along the way. And then the child thing comes up. 
And so there's just a lot of ways to look at this this character and either have sympathy for her or you can be critical of her or it can be a mix of of both. Um, are, are, are you willing, are we, can, I'd like to look at the other, um, some more um, commentaries. I want you to see what Rashi says, because it's, it's fascinating. And again, remember, this is Rashi using intertextual understanding to come up with his own midrash of what's really going on. Let's look at this. Sandra, do you want to read what Rashi says? Um, uh, about merry making, which is the word mitzahek. You want to read that right sure. here? Sure. Making merry. Hebrew. It's mitzahek. Mm -hmm. An expression of idolatry, as it is said in Exodus 32, 6. And they rose up to make merry. Which is the, and the, and the word to make merry is litzahek, but this is a the golden calf. Okay, just so you know. Another explanation an expression of illicit sexual relations, as it is said, below to mock let's let's it's all the same word. It's all the same word. Let's let's say me. Another explanation, an expression of murder, as it is said. Let the boys get up now and sport before us. Right. So and so let me let me say now in it's it's interesting because the third so the to mock me is the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife when um uh when she is um when he when he does she wants to have sport with him right and and he he won't do it so but there 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 it's um she, she feel you know he she feels he's being mocked or, or 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 vice versa but it's used in that kind of um illicit sexual relations way in the and then in idolatry and in and in the in ancient semitic script the sin, as opposed to the shin, like shin or sin, is often um, interchanged with the tzadi. So the um, the yisachaku, that, that kind of playing sport could be yitzchakaku, but it's too hard to say yitzchakaku, although yitzchak has that, so it's yisach, yitzchakaku. It's a hard word to say under any circumstances, but it's it's from the same root. And so um, they're going to, so they're going to um, have an, um, they're going to play an aggressive sport. So, um, so, so now pick up um, where it says from Sarah's reply. From Sarah's reply, for the son of this handmaid shall not inherit with my son. You learn that he would quarrel with Isaac regarding the inheritance and say, <clears throat> I am the firstborn and should take two portions. And they would go out to the field and he would take his bow and shoot arrows at him. As it is said, like one who wearies himself shooting firebrands and says, am I not joking? Right. So, so actually what's really interesting is that Rashi doesn't accuse necessarily Ishmael of doing anything of, you know, of um, sodomizing him or doing anything horrible to him, but that the word is supposed to make us think of that. And ultimately to make Yishmael look like a terrible person who's then going to demand that he gets the double portion of the firstborn, and this is where the money comes in. So if Abraham is a million dollars, then then uh, then then Yishmael is going to assist. He gets six hundred and fifty thousand, and he only the other one only gets three. You know that that kind of thing. But so this commentary is trying to understand what would motivate Sarah to actually make this um, decision. And um, and then the stone edition, the art scroll, which is you know um, leaning towards an orthodox point of view. Sandra, just look at this commentary on the word mocking or making sport. This term expresses what Sarah saw that convinced her that Ishmael could not remain in the household. <clears throat> Scripture uses this ver verb to denote the three cardinal sins: idolatry, adultery, and murder. This Ishmael's behavior proved thus. Sorry, that's different. Thus, Ishmael's behavior proved that he had become, oh, hold on, had become thoroughly corrupt and evil and had to be sent away. So, first of all, what are your thoughts on that? I'd love to hear what some of you think about this portrayal of Ishmael.
to me, it seems like an unwillingness to um, shade the characters who we think of as our patriarchs and matriarchs with uh, with negative characteristics. And it, this just feels forced to me as a way to get Sarah out of looking like she did something wrong. Thank you, Jack. I, I appreciate that. Sylvia? Thanks. Same, same. I'm, I'm thinking that, um, um, but taking the other side, I'm thinking maybe we're seeing that Ishmael but being the older son, and um, and um, but the son of a slave woman, um, maybe like an emotional bully kind of thing. Say, I really have it. I'm the oldest one. And just because she's a slave doesn't mean I'm not going to get everything. So, yeah. Maybe she's, maybe he is an emotional bully. So, but, but I think, that, I think the key here, it's interesting, is that we don't know. And the commentators will read what they feel they need to read to support an understanding of our important history in a way that makes sense to them. And that's and and I think that's the whole. I mean, if 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 this whole um, exercise in Machloket matters teaches any of us anything, what it teaches of us is that we cannot extricate our own personal experiences and biases from how we interpret Torah. By the way, that's what makes Torah so fantastic is that it really can be a mirror to any of us at any time in our lives. That's why it's such a fantastic document and so divinely inspired. That, th there's, there's no question about that. Um, I, I, I'd love to, let, let's go forward. There's just so but much- wait a second, they, But they're all, th those three that you showed us are all using their own expertise, which is so different from each other. Exactly. And they're all reputable scholars, right. you know, some modern, some ancient. And, and, and so what, we're, what, what I think, um, so, 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 so yes, so Rosalie, take that to the, take that thought to the next level. What does that mean to you? That these are all the, the, about these scholars. What, what does that say? It tells me I need, in a narrow sense, that I need to read the humash that I'm most comfortable with. That's one thing. And I tend to, you know, I tend to read, you know, more, more liberally. Um, but it also says on the other hand, that it's very, very important for us to read all the different interpretations. I mean, you know, when you, when you study Torah for so many years, as so many of us have done, we, in a narrow sense, we, we, we thought all these years one way, and then we come into this um, more intellectual class as we age and get wiser, and we see, you know, there's other ways to read it. So, you know, it's telling me that not to be stayed in my old way of thinking. That's great. I mean, that's, that's, really important and and really as long as you are wrestling with torah um I'm doing the right thing <laughs> you're doing the right, that's exactly right rosalie i'm so happy to hear that and i love i see i see mickey smiling we all appreciate that too and uh th there's never enough learning either anyway donna did you want to share something before we go on in our text oh only that it, it seems so relevant to what's happening just today because the Yester Tov and the Yester Hara. I mean, that, that, that bad interpretation is just as easy for people to make the negative, idolatry, adultery, murder. We don't like to think about that being part of, of what Israel wants to be. But um, those that, that feel it's, it's so um, black and white are not going to see the gray. And that's true today. That's all. This, an observation. It's still here. <laughs> We're still people. <laughs> it, it, no, ain't nothing changed. Okay. So um, we're going to skip these writing exercises. And um, so now, the, again, text study three, what are the implications for the children of Isaac and Ishmael today? 
And and by the way, I looked today. I just want you to know, I was trying to find a, like a an editorial or something written by a Palestinian political scientist on their interpretation, or even just an Arab political scientist on their interpretation of what they think is happening in Israel right now within the the Jewish you know population of the state. That there really is you know there's two Israels, and um and they've sort of you know one let the other sort of grow unchecked for too long in and again and and here we are so and and then of course and in America there's you know our relationship is so different so Yehezkel Landau um is uh, uh a dual Israeli American citizen an interfaith educator and already when you hear that you're going to know kind of where his eye looks leadership trainer, author, consultant, working to improve Jewish, Christian, Muslim relations and promote Israeli-Palestinian peace building for more than 35 years. He earned a Bachelor of Arts from Harvard, a Master of Theological Studies from their Divinity School and from the Hartford Seminary. So now he writes this pretty long thing. Um, Rosalie, I'm wondering if you'd be willing um, to read this. And, and this is now, this is from 2019, not that long ago, it feels like a hundred years ago because it's before COVID and everything else, but it's really only four years old. Um, but you know, it's implications for our time, Isaac and Ishmael and the three monotheistic faiths, faiths and then, and it's uh, the, from the Palestinian Academic Society for the Study of International Affairs. Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> Judaism views both Ishmael and Isaac ambivalently with strengths and weaknesses, merits and flaws. And we have noted that these mixed assessments along with the ambivalent portraits of Abraham and Sarah are in line with the overall Jewish approach to biblical personalities. None is flawless. Each is presented as a figure combining light and shadow. Such honest portrayals of, portrayals of biblical figures are humanizing and reassuring for we can more easily identify with morally flawed heroes than with holy and sinless ones. <clears throat> Examining the relationship between Ishmael and Isaac as the, as the Bible presents it through the variegated lens of Jewish tradition, we can glean some important lessons to help us address the present challenges facing their descendants. Jews and Arabs caught up in a territorial dispute over a shared holy land. Um, given the ongoing bitter and bloody conflict between Israelis and Palestinians over the, their common homeland, the future depends on us and what we do and on how we understand what is truly holy based on our respective faith traditions. Jews, Muslims, and Christians all need to broaden their sense of the sacred to affirm that life is holier than land. It's interesting. That God's love and blessing are bestowed upon all equally without hierarchical favoritism and that inclusive justice and compassion are both the essential attributes of the divine and the central imperatives to guide our behavior. Once we do this, we will have the capacity to change our victim and vindication, scripts using our scriptures as justification. With more pluralistic and compassionate faith orientations, we can come to see the Holy Land as a laboratory for collective consecration, not a battleground between peoples and theologies. If we choose this path of devotion, ready to sacrifice land rather than human lives, then the reconciliation which Ishmael and Isaac experienced in their lifetime can serve as an example for us, their faithful descendants, um, inshallah, im yirtzei Hashem, if God wills it, and if we do too. That was long. Thank you for reading that. <laughs> and I, I'd love to know I mean, we can look at this as it was, but I'd love to know your thoughts on uh, on what um, what on what what uh, Professor Landau says. By the way, we're going to read an opposite source too that 
really looks at it a different way, but um, did it resonate with you or um, Mickey? Well, there were a couple things in there that where they he played two concepts against the other, <clears throat> which really resonated. One was, do you sacrifice lives or land, which is more important? Right. That is so key, but I've never heard it put so succinctly. It's just wonderful. And there was another one earlier on when Rosalie said, oh, that's interesting. What was that? Do you remember Rosalie? Was that I don't, but I thought maybe it was the lives for land, but it may have been before that. I think it was this, such honest portrayals of biblical figures are humanizing and reassuring because we can easily identify with morally flawed hair, you know, heroes and, um, and, and, and basically acknowledging, you know, that Sarah is not good or bad, not necessarily, you can't say she's a good person or a bad person. She had strengths. Ishmael might have been a wonderful son to Abraham and Hagar and also maybe jealous of his brother. We don't know. You know, he, he might have known that even though he was beloved, you know, can you imagine, think about, I mean, I just think about this, think about the, you know, the actor who's waited their whole life, you know, they're, they're about to get Lear, you know, in the movie and, you know, they're ready for it. And then some other actor just sort of like walks in and is like so stunning. And the part you've waited for your whole life is over. I mean, the guy lived with Abraham and for, for alone for a long time. You know what I'm saying? So, so, you know, he probably was thinking, my, I know my dad loves me. Like this really is mine. Maybe he does have feelings. Not, not that he would, that, that he used them in a harsh way, but I mean, if we could all get deep into the minds of each of these family characters, wouldn't we have a story to write about them? And, and we would each write a different story. What Megan would say would be different than what I would say. And Jack would have a whole different perspective and, it's just a it's it's a remarkable opportunity, I think, to engage with this material. I just, is it can, can we go on and you we'll we'll have more time Could for you comments. just put that on the screen one more time. I am right here. Yeah. Yep. You want to? Are you just reading it over, Mickey? Yeah. Uh huh. You can go ahead and talk uh, it, you, you know. to the I, variegated lens of Jewish now. tradition. Oh. oh, I was saying that through the variegated lens of Jewish tradition, we can glean some important lessons to help us address the present challenges facing their descendants. Yeah. Jews and Arabs caught up in a territorial dispute over a shared holy land. Yeah, it's... The, the issue is, though, I think what we're learning, the issue is land, but there's so much, there's so much more than land. There's there's history, of there's course. integrity, there's there's um, feeling, um, uh, I mean, connected to our ancestors. There's there, it, it goes much more. Um, it goes much deeper than just it because it's because it's not, you know, Scott in Scott's class yesterday he was talking about all the things that happened from 19. 46 to, to 40 to 49. And, you know, one way to say what the Israel, Israelites said to these Palestinian families is eight miles from here, we have a house for you. Take the house over here. We're giving you a nice house. But, but they wanted their house. It was their house. You know what I'm saying? And it wasn't that they were being, these were like, you know, it was farmers and whatever. It was their land. Our attachment to our land, our place can be very, very historical and important um, for all of us. So now look at this. This is kind of hard to read. The implica but, but, but the implication for Ishmael's banishment for today, who's Rabbi, Rabbi Eliezer Malamed, an Israeli Orthodox rabbi in Rosh Hashiva of Yeshivat Har Bracha. And, um, and uh, so let's, uh, let's take a stab at this. I'm trying to think. Jack, would you be willing to read? Can you, can you see it? Yes, thank you. Uh, Israel, like Abraham and Sarah, also believed in the sons of Ishmael, but they abused our trust. But deep in her heart, Hagar was no longer Sarah's apprentice. Ishmael subconsciously realized this, and after the birth of Isaac, began mocking him. Some commentators say that in contrast to young Isaac, who grew up righteously, 
Ishmael began leaning towards idolatry and incest, while other commentators say he played games with Isaac that endangered his life, thereby revealing his inner desire to murder him because he hated Isaac for usurping his place. People would say, take a look at Abraham the Ivri. All his life he's been preaching about being careful of stealing illicit relations and murder. And here, his son Ishmael is a man as wild as an ass. With all this taken into consideration, we find no denunciation of Sarah and Abraham. The proof is that on Rosh Hashanah, the day where we are careful not to mention anything negative about Israel, our sages decreed that the story of Hagar and Ishmael's expulsion be read. In other words, the heavenly decree to expel the maid servant and her son applies even when it is not pleasant. For the law is the law. Hagar, who denied Sarah's kindness, and Ishmael, who, while still in the house of Abraham, dared to worship idols, steal, and threaten to murder, must receive their punishment. Indeed, on Rosh Hashanah, when Israel recognizes its uniqueness and specialness among all the nations, precisely then they, just, uh, they justifiably merit a good year. Implications for our times. Our situation today is very similar to that of the past. We thought if we acted justly with our Arab neighbors, the sons of Ishmael, if we made the land which under their hands was desolate blossom, if we developed the economy and their standard of living rose, if we awarded them rights that no Arab has in any Arab country, they would be appreciative. However, the more we contributed to their prosperity, their war against us grew. And even if we defeat them in wars they cause, they accuse us and unite with our enemies. The only option of remedying the situation is to strengthen the Jewish character of the state, to make clear to all that this land is ours and no other nation has a part or inheritance in it. Anyone who accepts this lovingly can live with us here in great dignity as a ger toshav. However, towards anyone who does not accept this and attempts to oust us from our land, we must act with all ethical means at our disposal in order to expel him. Only then, when sitting in another place, will he be able to reflect on all the good we have brought to the sons of Ishmael and the world. Then the sons of Ishmael will recognize our virtue that we are the sons of Israel, the receivers of the Torah and inheritors of the land promised to Abraham, and they too will join us in perfecting the world in the kingdom of God. So, so they're putting the blame on the other side, whoever wrote that. Well, it's a it's an Ashkenazi Orthodox rabbi. <laughs> right. It's, it's, it, he, he wrote, what we must do is strengthen the Jewish character. And then the next sentence is that this land is our land. Right. Didn't that come right afterwards? So yes. how yes. is that strengthening? I, when, when I read strengthening the Jewish character, I thought it meant strengthening them ethically to see both sides. But that's not how he goes on. No. And, and, and again, you know, there, there is a certain way to, to sort of look at the events that have unfolded in the last 20 years in Israel, really since Oslo, there is a way to look at that and say, and, and you, and I think we all have to be able to like, what were they thinking? Like what, how could, you know, to, to, to the, there is a way to be an Israeli and say, we extended every, you know, olive branch we could to, and still have a functioning country, you know, and, and, and the leadership, the Palestinian leadership rejected it and chose terror over, over reason. I mean, this was written in 16 by, by this guy. You can, you can see how, I mean, and, and again, you know, if, if our fad had accepted the deal or if, you know, I mean, if there, if, if, if the times that people have come to the table, how life would have been different. All he had to do was say, yes, shake the hand. Was he, was it for his own grandeur among his people? How, I think the real question is how much is what like Netanyahu is doing today to protect his own ass is like Arafat when he didn't, when he didn't accept the peace negotiations. I mean, think, I mean, they're the same in, in that sense. 
It's not about the people. It's not about the health of the country. It's not about understanding what's needed to, to have a safe and secure Israel where equal rights are accorded to all. It's worried about going to jail. I'm sure it's much more complicated than that. And, you know, I, and I don't pretend to know, but what I'm saying is like, first of all, that's a very difficult thing to read. And, and almost the complete opposite about, uh, from what Landau says before him. It's so interesting. And, and, um, but you could imagine 50% of, if you put all, all, all the Jews in the world, you know, together, some would really understand what the rabbi's saying and others would say what the professor is saying. And, um, and, and, and maybe we can sort of appreciate elements of both, but it really does help us understand how difficult it is to be able to make life-changing decisions when there's such radically different ways of understanding the situation. Other thoughts? This is, there's other really interesting commentaries to go on. Jack, thank you for that beautiful reading. Thank you. So I have to say that I was very um, influenced by a teaching I heard once and um, this rabbi conveniently skips the second day of Rosh Hashanah. And the teaching was that when you treat people who you don't care about so much badly, you change yourself in such a way that you then are forced to treat people you do care about badly. And the Akedah is the continuation of this story. And, and I found that a very meaningful way to view uh, the banishment of Hagar and Ishmael. That is so interesting. So, so develop that a little bit more. Are you saying that by um, by Abraham following Sarah's command to to banish her son, or her or, or, um, Hagar and Ishmael, it then it it changes him enough that he's actually willing to go, okay, I'll sacrifice. I, is, are you saying that one impacts the other? Right. His personality or his character changes by doing something that he probably shouldn't have done so that now he's on a path that takes him to the Akedah. And, and I think we, you know, especially people who only go to the first day of Rosh Hashanah, you know, they, they miss the other piece of this. And I think that's a really important part of the whole story is that the, the Akedah is not necessarily viewed as a, as a reward in this sense, but as a punishment that, uh, that if you treat somebody you don't care about badly, you're going to end up having to treat somebody you do care about. Badly. Well, but, but I think the real, the, the um, I, I'm, I'm forgetting the word, but the, the real unknown in this is God, because Abraham does not want to expel his uh, Hagar and Ishmael. God says, do what Sarah says. You do, do it, listen to her. And by, so, so Abraham listens to God and listens to Sarah. And then it's God who says, now I want you to do this. And I mean, so where's God in all this for yeah, you? Jim? So, so I guess this is to me, this progression of Noah to Abraham, to Moses, that Noah doesn't balk at all. Abraham does a little bit of balking, but it's not until Moses that you really have people arguing with God. And I think it's a progression. I don't think Abraham is the end of the line. He's the beginning. Okay, I love that. That's that's really fascinating. And, and I'd love to talk to you more about it as we get closer to the high holidays. So- um, uh, so, oh, can, can I just, since we're on this subject? Yes, dear. Can can I just show you this picture that Ria sent to me yesterday? You know, she's she's in Italy. Uh, can you see this? Kind of. It's a painting. It's a painting by Ackers. Okay. And I forget what. It, anyway, it's Isaac. It's not Isaac. I mean, it's Abraham getting ready to slay. Um, Isaac. Yeah. And it's pretty gruesome. This is maybe one of the worst paintings that, why is this on there? Oh, cancel. I, I, I mean, am I not, I'm not getting this across, am I? I, I think, well, maybe Sylvia, can you bring it up and you can share, I'll let you share the screen. Um, that's really, I mean, uh, that's the, you know, what you can do, uh, Marsha, is uh, if you spotlight uh, Rosalie, we could see it. 
People can just pin Rosalie. Yeah, just pin it. Pin her. Okay. Yeah. We I, actually I, looked at this, I think, when we remember when we did that whole series of art? Some of you were yes. with me on the Ake Da, and I think Lily yes. brought this project. Yes. 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 It, it, I just was so horrified, and now we're talking about it today. And I just, this is just horrifying. That's all I can say. This interpretation is what I'm trying to say that a Absolutely. father would that a father would do this to his son. That's why, I, yep, which is why I always say the guy must have been nuts. I mean, if somebody did that to your kid, your son, you and your father, your your the man says, God tells me to do this, you'd put him in jail or a mental institution. You wouldn't just say, oh my God, you know. Yeah. And, uh, some of our interpretations really do say that there was a good reason for that. And Abraham knew that it was going to come out all right. Well, I don't believe that myself. So first of all, I, so I just wanted to, so more to talk about. I want to yeah. just look at this for a second. So this was, again, you know, two sides to every story, uh, a stabbing and shooting in Hebron in eighteen. So here's two different ways of looking at it. This one came from Al Jazeera and one was Israeli International News. Al, Al Jazeera says, Israeli force, forces kill Palestinian in Hebron after alleged stabbing. Palestinian shot dead near Ibrahimi Mosque in the center of Hebron after allegedly trying to stab an Israeli soldier. In the Israeli news says, IDF soldier wounded in Hebron stabbing attack. Soldier wounded in terror attack near Tomb of the Patriarchs in Hebron, terrorist shot and killed. So, uh, you know, I, I just, we're, we're not gonna look at those. I, or we might, uh, well, we, we could, but um, I wanna just, I wanna um, I just show you a few other uh, interpretations of the Sarah Hagar story. We can go back, at the end, we'll have time. We can go back to those articles or we can really talk more. We can sort of bring our, I'd like to bring our learning into what's happening in Israel now. I do think it's, I, I, I do think it's worth, exploring and, and taxing ourselves to see what, what can Torah teach us and, and help us um, uh, be our best selves um, in each of the ways. So the Book of Jubilees, um, which is a Hellenistic in its, in its writing, so it's a commentary, but was not included in our canon, uh, says, uh, and Sarah saw Ishmael playing and dancing and Abraham rejoicing very greatly. Ah, we didn't even hear uh, you know, that the, the, Sarah sees Ishmael and Abraham loving each other. And she was jealous of Ishmael. And she said to Abraham, drive out this girl and her son, because the son of this girl will not inherit with my son, Isaac. So Isaac's not even in the picture. She's, it's Abraham who's in the picture. And the matter was grievous in the sight of Abraham. Interesting, because, you know, you wonder, you know, where is he in, in, in this drama? I'll share something else with you. This is from the, um, from uh, the, uh, commentate there, you know, in the early 20th century Bible commentator, John Skinner. Playing with Isaac, her son, um, these last words with Isaac, her son, are essential to the sense and must be restored to this with restored with Septuagint. Um, uh, it, it, it is the spectacle of the two young children playing together because he's comparing two different uh, ver Gears's versions innocent of social distinctions that excites Sarah's maternal jealousy and prompts her cruel demand. And then the anchor Bible offers was playing. Traditionally mocking would require the preposition b, like b um, um, before it, b mitzacheik, in, in, a, in, a, in a mocking way um, to designate the object. To judge, however, from some of the ancient versions, the original text appears to have been had to have included bit with, with her son Isaac, which is lacking in the in the Masoretic text. So they're comparing the Septuagint text to the Masoretic text. Um, so at this point, Ishmael would Ishmael would now be at least fifteen years old, but his playing with Isaac needed uh, need me no more than the older boy was trying to amuse his little brother. There is nothing in the text to suggest that he was abusing him, a motive deduced by many troubled readers in their effort to account for Sarah's anger. 
And that, and so that was, you know, how he's justifying these comments. Um, I want Rochelle, would you, would you be interested in reading this passage from Genesis Rabbah? Sure, but yeah, I was thinking as an older sister, having been an only child for a number of years, and all of a sudden, this little kid comes in the house, and my mother thinks that I'm going to move over for this kid. <laughs> and I think, and I think about about Palestine, and here comes the United Nations saying, "Here, play nicely. You're both." I, I care for both of you. It's human nature. So. I think that, boy, I mean, that really, if, it, I mean, that says it all, those two words, human nature is yes. really powerful. I and, was the older sister, and how dare they? It, God, that's so interesting. And so you can really appreciate, uh, you know, so many dynamics in this relationship. I'm the baby. So I have a very different, you know what I'm saying? It, it depends where you are, even in your birth order, how that can inform the choices you make and the things that you do, right? Yeah, Fast because this baby was cute and needy and usurped my place. Yeah. Well, so would you share with that? Would you read for us here? Uh, and yeah. this is, uh, okay, this is great. This is a, a midrash from the, from the um, 500s. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, Rev Shimon ben Yochai said, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva used to interpret this to Ishmael's shame. Thus Rabbi Akiva interpreted. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born unto A Abraham, Mitzedek. Now Mitzedek, refers to none else but sexual immorality, as in the verse, the Hebrew servant who you have brought unto us came unto me to make sport of me. And Thus, that's, that's Joseph that she's talking about. Uh-huh. Thus, this yeah. teaches that Sarah saw Ishmael ravish maidens, seduce married women, and dishonor them. Rav Ishmael taught this term, mitzchak, refers to idolatry as in the verse and rose up to make sport. Uh, this teaches that Sarah saw Ishmael build altars, catch locusts and sacrifice them. Rev Eliezer said the term mitzchak refers to bloodshed as in the verse, let the young men I pray thee arise and sport before us. Rev Azariah said to Rev Levi's name, Ishmael said to Isaac, let us go and see our portions in the field. Then Ishmael would take a, bat, a bow and, and arrows and shoot them in Isaac's direction whilst pretending to be playing. Thus it is written, like a madman scattering deadly firebrands, arrows is one who cheats his fellow and says I was only joking. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight. Thus it is written, and shooteth his eyes from looking upon evil, meaning he shut his eyes from Ish Ishmael's evil ways and was reluctant to send him away. <laughs> so this was an uh, this this was an elaborate more elaborate version of something we already read. But this idea was that Abraham. I mean, again, there's no textual basis in the story to help us see Ishmael that way. But if you believe that, that, that if, if this was who he was, that he really was an aggressive and hostile man, that Abraham just didn't want to see the truth. And um, that's one way of looking at it. If I wanted to close, there's a very interesting, you know, this whole story is written about in, um, in the uh, Islamic, um, in the in Islamic commentaries. And, um, I, it's it's actually a little bit long. Uh, I want to share one more source with you, and then we'll close up if you have a few more minutes. Um, but I but I will but I will um, I'm going to try to send you this whole source packet so that you can sort of look at these over and wrestle with them on your own. But let me just share one more, Megan. I'm hoping 
you'll read this next thing for us. Hang on a second. <clears throat> So this is um, the separation of the Abrahamic family and Islamic tradition. What is the potential of the stories of the Abrahamic family for promoting coexistence or separation between Jews, uh, Christians, and Muslims, according to Rabbi Dr. Mark Gopin? Let's see. Go ahead. Uh, the Abrahamic family myth lives and breathes an independent reality, nevertheless, in the lives and hundreds of millions of Jews, Christians, and Muslims. It is a critical means of organizing the world and making sense of one's history, one's religion, one's origins, or even one's future. However, it is a story mediated through different lenses, depending on the religious group with innumerable variations based on the subgroupings and the individual predilections of millions of interpreters. Yet the potentially unifying power of the metaphor is unmistakable. Its persistence becomes a metaphor in and of itself, of an abiding connectivity um, the monotheistic peoples feel toward each other, even though that connectivity has often expressed itself as jealousy, competition, disappointment, and brutalizing murder. In a word, monotheists often act as relatives in an intense but troubled and murderous family. Myth that is shared has a way of bringing infinitely complex problems into a manageable cognitive structure of reality, allowing problems of dizzying proportions to be understood by the human mind and absor absorbed by the human heart. This in turn is a perfect tool for motivating large groups of people to violence. However, myth can also can myth also can allow communities to proceed by means of its own expansion and development or extension into modern constructs that often elude rationalistic methods of negotiation and diplomacy, especially those intended for masses of people. This creates possibilities in the pro-social development of human relations. And mythical, and mythical possibility is the midwife of cultural conflict, resolution, and peacemaking. It provides the dramatic construct for thinking about and treating enemies in a fundamentally new way, which is the same which at the same time becomes embedded in familiar myth. Be beautifully read mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and not, not completely easy to unpack, um, but uh, any thoughts on that before I share some of my own and we wrap up this conversation? Talking about the power of myth, or I would say the power of Midrash as myth to put huge movements and decisions into motion. It felt more, more globalistic to me than the different opinions. It was a, it was a hopeful attempt <laughs> to yes. see mythology as moving us forward rather than inciting or doing both. Yes, doing both. absolutely. And, 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 I, and I think, you know, what, what they, they say in, in, in almost in everything, it all comes down to powerful storytelling. Because a, a, a powerful story can change us in fundamental ways, right? And the story that we choose to tell um, about, or, or, th that expresses our hopes and wishes can inspire people to share our hopes and wishes to help us work together for an end that we would like to see. You, you know what I'm saying? Like it, everything can start with one person. Some uh, One person can have a vision that they can share that can e evolve into, I, 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 I don't know that's exactly how he was using myth, but the, but the point is, um, Myth is a way of looking at something. I mean, the Passover Exodus story, I would tell you, is the most powerful myth ever. Like that's that's the 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 myth of what happened to the Jewish people, but it defines the you know the core of the ethical values that I love so much about Judaism. That's probably the best example of how a myth can be used for good to change the world in such in such meaningful.
beautiful ways to welcome the stranger in our midst and 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 all that. Um, Sylvia, yes. Um, and the miss um, can you speak, maybe use in good ways, but not necessarily be actually the true story. Um, when you think about the um, the beginnings of the civil rights movement in this country, who do you think of? Martin Luther King, most of us do. Um, but what was behind him and what started that? We don't talk about that so much. Or who was my favorite of those people, Rosalie Parks? Who were they? And how did they get going? What we see is Martin Luther King. And then we see Malcolm X. We don't see all the in-betweens because there's a lot of rich, rich history. But it doesn't negate the fact that MLK and the civil rights movement happened and was so important to us. It doesn't negate that. It just synthesizes it maybe because we like heroes. We really do like heroes. You might I, not like Thank you. That's And I was just listening to an NPR piece yesterday actually on some lesser known figures who are so essential to the civil rights movement, Sylvia. It was really interesting. I'm, I'm gonna share a hope that I have. Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of an eternal optimist, although I'm also no dummy. I, I, I really think that at this moment in time, none of us sitting here on this Zoom call in America, and even people, many people in Israel can really understand what's about, what, what's going to unfold um, in the Jewish homeland in the next day, week, and month. I, I think it's gonna be a very complicated Passover, I do not know. I do not know today whether I'm actually going to get in there. The airports are closed. I mean, I wouldn't have been able to say that to you yesterday. So we're we're really like we're literally like the ark is tipping on the top of the mountain. I mean, we're going like I don't know. But I will say this. I do hope that the people who are not Jewish, who do not feel this is their homeland, who are critical of Israel, will actually be, will go like this. I'm not saying they're gonna let, we'll go like, oh my God. Like, oh my God. It's not just like a monolithic, like these awful is right. Like, oh my God, that country is really in disarray. You know, and and maybe our horrible judgments rooted in anti-Semitism. <laughs> like, I mean, like, I just hoping it might open some people's minds who don't know and didn't really know what party lines they were hearing about what, but to, re to recognize that the soul of Judaism has always been in conflict between the Jews themselves and that what's happening in Israel is not a reflection of how everybody feels or, or, or what should happen. And, and, and maybe we all, all human beings take more responsibility for listening better and, and really having ownership of the future of that country. Because one of the things I did here, and I'm sure many of you have as well, is that basically the, the sort of the more affluent up and coming liberal Jews, this was a fascinating um, panel I heard, kind of just said, eh, who cares? My life is great, I'll vote, but it's okay if we don't have, that no one could have imagined getting to this point. You sort of took some basic sort of structures at that the court's gonna always over, you know, the court has control, they're normal, they're smart people, whatever. So when that became in peril, everyone was like, what, wh why has my head been in the sand so long? And, and hope, so there's just a lot about to change among the Israeli citizens in the country and we need to be there to support them um, in whatever way that they need. And including the, the ultra religious who are really gonna be confused and torn. And many of them, uh, you know, again, un, uh, really uneducated about how the government has been working. Anyway, any last thoughts before yes, I- Yes, I, I just, I, I wrote to my daughter, Susie, when we first started the class, because you asked me what, what I had heard and all she wrote back, which is her way is, protests making a difference and they are postponing the judicial reform more time to plan so that's good isn't yeah. it 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 is um and yeah, they were supposed to vote today and so right? that's yes and that's so that's not happening right so that's and, good okay thank you and you know what that's a perfect way i'll just say 
Thank you for ending our class um, you know, in this way. Thank you all for studying with me. We have one more of these. It's going to be not in April. It's going to be in May because in April, starting next. No. Okay. Let me just tell you what's coming up next week. Um, Cantor Marcia Lane is going to do some fabulous text study for the next three weeks on the book of Ruth um, and the book of Shir Hashirim. I hope you'll come. It's going to be different than anything you've heard. And then after that, Cantor Matt Ousterklein is going to do a, um, uh, a really wonderful course on pop culture and the rabbis. And that'll take us into May. And then I'll conclude this whole unit uh, the last uh, the last weekend of May, right before Shavuos. So anyway, love studying with you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. It's Thanks, great. Michelle. Is it going to be, is, hi, really Marcia, good. will it be the same time and the same links on Mondays? I mean, yes, yeah. always the same time, always the same link on Monday. Different okay. on Sunday night with Scott. Yeah, okay. you guys are fantastic. I so much appreciate it. Thank you. Glad it's you're here. Really, really excellent like today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you